My name is Kona, and I am a forensic pathologist. That means I'm a medical doctor, and I determine how and why people die. So life and death is essentially my career. Um, I'm also First Nations. Uh, my father is Cree from Peguis, Manitoba, and my mother is Mohawk from Ganawage in Quebec. It's near Montreal. I am the only First Nations forensic pathologist in this country. I have a unique perspective, and I use that unique perspective in order to understand death and Indigenous people. So these images should be familiar to most. This is an image taken from my mother's community of Ganawage. These people are protesting the Dakota Access Pipeline. This red ribbon symbolizes the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls in this country. The irony is not lost on me that I am four times more likely to end up on my own autopsy table than just about anybody else. And I'm wearing red today in support. This is a reality in most or many First Nations communities. Lack of access to clean drinking water. And this is another reality. This home was burnt to the ground by fire. And I unfortunately see many fire deaths in Indigenous communities. This image should be familiar to just about everybody. And if it isn't, it will be by the end of this talk. So one of some of the key questions in any death investigation is to answer a few questions. So who died? Where did they die? When did they die? By what means and why? And the why is something that I get asked a lot in my job and I get asked a lot as a First Nations person. Why don't they just move? Why don't they get jobs? Why don't they join civilization? Why don't they take care of their kids? Why don't they stop wasting my tax dollars? Why don't they just get over it? To understand the why, you have to know a little something about the what. This is a cause of death triangle. When people die, deaths generally fall into three categories. Natural disease, a heart attack, or in my medical language, a myocardial infarction, pneumonia, cancer, injury, motor vehicle collision, a fatal descent from height, a gunshot, deaths from toxic substances, alcohol, drugs, and poisons. And all three of these intersect. It is important to understand the why behind the causes of death in order to help explain how to prevent deaths and to improve life in society. There's another cause of death triangle for Indigenous people in this country. Healthcare, forced sterilization, experimentation, lack of access to basic healthcare needs, government, the past system, the Indian Act, the residential school system, and the criminal justice system, increased incarceration rates, lack of jury representation, and issues with policing. All of these factors, they come into play and they add layers of complexity to the why. So to understand a little bit more about the why, you also need to know something about root cause. The Indian Act is Canadian federal law that governs the lives of all First Nations people in this country. The Indian Act, um, from this, flowed the creation of band councils, reserves, um, the past system, discrimination against Indigenous women. And under the Act, First Nations people were denied the right to vote. They were forbidden from forming political organizations, and they were also for prohibited from speaking their language, practicing their, tradi their traditions, and their cultures. One of the worst and most devastating institutions created as a result of the Indian Act was the residential school system. The goal was literally to kill the Indian in the child. It has been strongly pressed on myself 
that Indian children should be withdrawn as much as possible from the parental influence, and the only way to do that would be to put them in central training industrious, industrial schools. Now think about that for a little bit. This law, this Canadian law, tore families apart. And it was endorsed by Sir John A. Macdonald in 1883. This is Bertle Indian Residential School. I want you to remember this image. For places like this, Indigenous children were forcibly removed from their homes and their families. They were separated from their siblings. They were punished for speaking their languages. Diseases uh, and deaths from these diseases, such as tuberculosis and influenza, were rampant. There was forced sterilization of young girls and women. There was experimentation on malnourished students. And there was rampant physical emotional, mental, and sexual abuse. The Indian residential school system was instituted by the Canadian government under the Department of Indian Affairs and the church. The goal was to educate, civilize, and assimilate indigenous children into the Canadian and Christian way of life. Attendance was mandatory and strictly enforced by Indian agents. It's estimated that 150,000 children attended these schools in Canada. The last one closed in 1996. As a healthcare professional, I have treated many people suffering from the effects of abuse and trauma, suicide, post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, addiction, increased incarceration, anxiety, homelessness, and domestic violence. The people who suffer from this go through an unbelievably long and difficult journey to heal from a broken spirit, and many never do. As a forensic pathologist, I see firsthand the end result of much of the suffering. So consider for a moment how these people suffering from the effects of trauma and abuse, how difficult it is for them and consider as well the challenges faced by the people who are trying to help them. Imagine then entire communities affected by this where this kind of abuse and trauma is commonplace. Imagine for a moment um, how many people it's affected. Imagine generations of broken families. Try to imagine the unimaginable loss. I hope now you're beginning to understand the why. So we're gonna fast forward to today. Um, I want you to see these children and I want you to see them very well. Jethro, Curran, Paul, Robin, Reggie, Kyle, and Jordan. These seven young people traveled hundreds of kilometers from their families. They left their homes to go to Thunder Bay in Northern Ontario. They did this in order to get something that so many of us take for granted, a basic high school education. They wanted better for themselves and their communities and their families also wanted better for them. These seven children died between the year 2000 and 2011. Once again, they were forced to leave their homes and their families, and once again, they were lost. The residential school system still haunts us today. See her face. This 15-year-old girl was named Tina Fontaine. She was part of a broken foster care system in this country in which Indigenous children are disproportionately represented. Her remains were pulled from the river, the Red River in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and a 50-something-year-old man was charged with her murder. He was recently acquitted of all charges. Indigenous children in this country are still being denied the right to a good life, a fair chance, and they're still dying for, this education, for their education. Since the inquest into the seven Indigenous youth deaths in Thunder Bay, two more children have been lost. This is happening now in 2018. 
So with social media, as it's expanding into all aspects of society, uh, it acts as a sounding board for many people. And certain attitudes towards indigenous people are painfully evident. Because much of the Aboriginal population in Canada is just satisfied being alcohol or drug abusers, living in poor conditions, etc., they have to have the will to change. It's not society's fault. And of course, this has nothing to do with missing or murdered Aboriginal women. It's not a murder case. It could be a suicide, accidental. She got drunk and fell in the river and drowned. Who knows? Typically, many Aboriginals have very short lifespans, talent or not. These comments were made on social media surrounding the death of a very prominent Inuit artist in Ottawa. And her death is now being considered suspicious. What I need everybody to understand is that there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And the non-Indigenous people in this country need to also answer their own whys. But times are changing. There is hope. There's always hope. The Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples was completed in 1996. The Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement in 2007. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission in 2015. And now, the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. This is going on as we speak. I get asked the why all the time. And one of the biggest questions I get asked is, well, why don't you just get over it? The inevitable answer I give is it took hundreds of years to inflict this kind of trauma. It will take at least as long to heal from it. I asked you to remember an image earlier on. This is Bertel Indian Residential School today. I want you to remember this, and I want you to remember the why. This is my father. He was a student at Bertel School, and he had the strength to endure a system that was meant to prevent people like me from ever existing in the first place. Whatever strength he had and passed on to me has allowed me to stand here before you and tell you about this. And I hope from this talk that you were beginning to think and understand and know about the why. Nyawa, Mingwetch.